Hello, it's Miss Heather, piano and voice teacher at Conservatory of the Ozarks, recording a study guide video for handbells. So, my first question is, describe the growth of handbells in the United States, including names, dates, organizations, etc. That's a long answer. So, Handbells were first rung in the United States in September of 1844, which happened to be when Arthur Nichols was four years old. The people who were performing with bells for the first time in the United States were called the Campanologian Band. They were from England. Um, they were from... Uh, the Liverpool area in northern England uh, in Lancashire. At the time that they started ringing bells, there were no professional bell ringers. Nobody got paid. They were all amateurs just ringing for fun. And it was common at that time for people to ring bells or to play brass together. Workers, you know, they would do that after work for fun. And they started getting paid almost right away. They had eight people in their group. Only seven people would be on stage at a time. They had two bells each, so a total of 14 bells. Their director, Mr. Anderson, played violin and taught them all their parts. They learned everything by ear and by memory. They didn't read sheet music. And <clears throat> they played at the um, some of the famous theaters in London, like the Adelphi Theater. And then when P.T. Barnum came to England in the 1840s, I think 1842, looking for performers, he saw their act and brought them to the United States to perform in his museums and um, shows, not in his circus because he didn't have a circus yet. And so he made them dress in Swiss costumes and pretend to be Swiss because just before that, the Rainier family had come to the United States. They were a family group and they sang with close, mellow harmony and they just caused the mania for everything Swiss. Their relative was the organ tuner who didn't make it to the church on time on Christmas Eve which was why Silent Night was written, that whole story. Um, so he got a copy of Silent Night from the pastor at that church, and then they introduced Silent Night to America. And um, because they were so popular, um, P.D. Barnum was kind of trying to play off that popularity. And the bell ringers were very popular. They played um, a tour of the United States uh, up and down the East Coast, the Mississippi River, Cuba, and in New York City they played at Niblo's Garden Theater. It was a really warm September that year, so it had indoor and outdoor venues. Um, they played for the, they played at the White House for President Tyler and Dolly Madison. Um, they, uh, Edgar Allan Poe saw them perform and he wrote this satirical article about how they were automatons because they were so fast. And Julia Marie Child saw them. She was a lady who wrote over the river and through the woods and she loved them. And of course Arthur Nichols saw them. And then they returned to England, performed there, and they also did like a European tour. They actually had their bells seized by the Spanish government during the Spanish Revolution in 1848. And I think, and they completed another American tour. And then they kind of dropped out of history. And then P.T. Bronham brought a group of five bell ringers later, a few years later to the United States. So 
Arthur Nichols, who saw them play when they first came to the United States, he grew up attending Christ Church in Boston, otherwise known as the Old North Church in the poem Paul Revere's Ride. And um, he saw these churches in New England that had their church bells on the ground in the churchyard instead of up in the bell tower where they belonged. And a lot of those bells actually were made by Paul Revere for these New England churches. So um, as an adult, he invested his own money into having those bells repaired and restored and then put back up into the church houses, into the bell towers so they could be used. And he got paid about $50 a year to ring bells. He um, went to Europe, he studied medicine, and he studied bells. Um, and then he passed on his love of bell ringing to his daughter, Margaret Shercliffe. And she uh, also went to visit Europe and the Whitechapel handbell manufacturers in London gave her a one octave set of their handbells and she kept those in storage for years and um, didn't really do anything with them for like 20 years. She um, was married to this wealthy landscape architect and she was really progressive. She actually got attacked by the police when she attended a workers strike where they were demanding a 48 hour work week instead of a 54 hour work week at a textile mill and and she didn't need to be there she was really wealthy her whole life but um that's how she was her and her husband built this house together that they lived in and um they like did uh, like all the carpentry and stuff inside themselves and it was this remote location without electricity and even without indoor plumbing I think and um, she had an uncle who was a famous sculptor and he actually sculpted later the emblem for the handbell association and her hand is like holding the handbell he, she was the model for the sculpture so, after she, you know, lived her life and everything, um, in 1937, she invited, you know, some of her friends and family to Crane Mansion to uh, celebrate Christmas Eve with her, and they she got out the handbells that she'd received all those years before and so they thought instead of singing Christmas carols they would ring the Christmas carols with the handbells. So they did that and they really liked it, they really enjoyed it and so that was kind of how the whole handbell thing got started in the United States. They formed the New England the New England uh, Guild of Handbell Ringers and um, they, you know, played handbells. It was going really well. And then in 1954, they changed their name to the American Guild of English Handbell Ringers or something like that. And, uh, or handbell musicians. And uh, they've been going strong since 1954. They have 12 regions in the United States. They do yearly events. They have a publication called The Overtones where they, you know, show new handbell compositions. And that's pretty much all I can remember about that question, I think. Oh, there's also someone named William Ship, who was an English expatriate who had a three octave set that he rang with his son. And I think that's pretty much everything. <laughs> so let's check the answer. See how many things I forgot. <clears throat> so the Campanologian band was from Oldham near Liverpool in Lancashire in North England. 
Oh, I forgot to say all the members were in their late 20s or, or their, their 20s or late teens. They began ringing tunes together in the 1830s. It was common for workers to play bells or brass together back then. They became called the Lancashire Bell Ringers. They had eight, only seven on stage at a time. There were no professional handbell groups back then. People were amateurs. No one got paid. They started touring for money almost right away. They had 14 bells, two bells a person. In 1841, they were brought to London by John Henry Anderson. Oh, that's right. He was known as the Wizard of the North, not the director. He was a magician who invented pulling a rabbit from a hat, performed at the Pavilion Theater. In 1842, they returned to London. In 1843, they went back to the Adelphi Theater in London. This was published in the Illustrated London News. Henry Johnson was a director, coach, and violinist. They learned their parts by ear and played by memory. None of them could read music. By now, they have more than 14 bells. In 1844, P.T. Barnum toured England looking for acts, brought them to America to play in American theaters and in his museums, not the circus because he didn't have the circus yet. September 12, 1844 was the first time bells rang in America. Nebulous Garden Theater in uptown Manhattan was a very popular theater venue with both indoor and outdoor venues. September that year was very warm in New York City. P.T. Barnum had the dress with Swiss costumes. Da 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 da. Oh, they performed at the Broadway Tabernacle, which was built for Finney, the famous evangelist, which held three to 4,000 people, and they sold it out for an entire week. Um, next, they went to Boston and played at Castle Garden in Battery Park. It was a military battery originally to protect Manhattan, one of the few places still standing where they played. They played at the White House for President Tyler, Dolly Madison and Edgar Allan Poe heard them. <coughs> Who wrote the satirical article? Olivia Marie Child. She had 42, or they had 42 bells by the time they met Lydia Marie Child. Oh, and she was an abolitionist. They made a ton of money, they traveled the whole country. They went to Canada, I forgot to say that. In 1847, they went back to England after a three-year tour. They then did a tour of the European continent. In 1848, they got stuck in Spain during the revolution. The Spanish government seized their bells. <coughs> Eventually, they did a world tour, returned to the US, then dropped out of history. In 1850, P.T. Barnum brought a group of five bell ringers. Arthur Nichols was born in 1840 in Boston. In 1844, the Swiss Bell Ringers, or the Campanologian Band, rang for the first time when he was four. Grew up near Old North Church. Um, sextons would play him tunes on the bells. He eventually got paid 50 years, $50 a year to ring the bells. Arthur went to Harvard in 1862, earned a degree in medicine, went to Paris and England to study in 1863. Heard change ringing in London while he was there. And William Ship was the English expat. He had four sons with five octaves set and they toured. That's what that was. Margaret Shercliffe. <clears throat> uh, oh, Beacon Hill. That was the name of Margaret Shercliffe's house. And Auguste St. Gardens was the famous American sculptor who was Margaret's uncle. Margaret married Arthur Shercliffe, famous wealthy landscape architect. made a windmill at their house. In 1902 she went to England to learn about change ringing. Whitechapel gave her a one octave set of bells. Oh, it was in 1924 on Christmas Eve. That was an important date. I got messed up. And then that led to the formation of the Beacon Hill Ringers, America's first amateur ringers. And then in 1937 they founded the New England Guild of English handbell ringers. 
Such a long name. The New England Guild of English Handbell Ringers. In 1954, the American Guild of English Handbell Ringers was started by Margaret. The American Guild of English Handbell Ringers. So you just have to remember New England Guild in 37 and then American Guild in 54. Oh yeah, and they were afraid that they wouldn't have 26 people show up, which was how many they needed, but they had 300 show up. And they had their first three conferences there at Castle Hill. Okay, and then I got pretty much everything else. Let's just double check these other alternate notes down here. Uh... Castle Hill. I think pretty good. I mean, I think I did. I got a few of those dates mixed up, so probably not perfect yet, but I remembered a lot of it. It's a lot to remember, so half thumbs up for me. Not quite like full thumbs up. I'll keep studying.